there, J.H. Moncrief here with a brief reading of an excerpt from Dragonfly Summer, my new novel out from Flame Tree Press. I hope you enjoy it. On the day she died, the woman wrote a letter to a friend she hadn't seen in over 20 years. She could feel her death coming, hovering over her as if the grim reaper himself were breathing down her neck. If she'd known it was her last day on earth, she would have spent it with her husband. They would have eaten all her favorite things, chocolate cake and spaghetti and sushi, and come up with a suitable name for the baby at last, laughing at all the ridiculous suggestions in the Name That Baby book. They would have visited the petting zoo one last time, where she'd bury her face in the pony's mane and hear its soft snort of greeting. But since she didn't know, she wrote a letter. She thought a lot about what she should say to her friend, a friend who had become a stranger over the years. No matter what she said, no matter how nicely she worded it, the letter would still be a burden, an albatross of the past crushing the recipient to the ground. She understood this and dreaded it, this thing she had to do, but there was no alternative. It had to be done. Her friend had to know, had to understand all that had happened since that terrible night. In this case, ignorance wasn't bliss, it was fatal. The child in her womb kicked, demanding attention. Over the last few weeks, the flutters that once made her smile had turned into a full-on assault that took her breath away. Her stomach growled in sympathy. Hold on, baby, I'll feed us in a minute. Mama's just got something she's got to do first. She couldn't keep her eyes on the paper, the multitude of blank lines waiting to be filled, causing anxiety and guilt. Given in to one last procrastination, she picked up a photo, intending to gaze at it for just a minute. Her teenage smile grinned back at her, her arms wrapped around her two best friends, looking like she didn't have a care in the world, which should be the way of childhood, but so sadly seldom is. One of the three girls challenged the camera, her chin tilted upward, eyes narrowed. It was this girl, now grown, that the woman addressed her letter to, this friend who had always been the serious one, the smartest of the three, she would figure out what to do. The woman regretted not getting a hold of her sooner, but steeled herself to do the right thing now. Better late than not at all, she thought, wishing she believed it. As she bent over the paper, her phone rang, startling her so the first mark she made was an ugly scrawl. She closed her eyes. Take it easy. You don't know who it is. It could just be, she risked a peek unknown number. The scariest words in the world, but on that day she was tired of being scared, tired of being a victim. She answered, hearing her caller's hateful breathing. It was like a spider crawling inside her ear, but she refused to be intimidated any longer. Before they could speak, she screamed into the phone, you better leave me alone. I know who you are. Do you understand? I know who you are. Pressing the power button, she threw the phone across the room where it landed with a muffled thud on the carpet. She buried her face in her arms and sobbed, startling the child inside her into stillness. The tears didn't last long, though. She had the opportunity to set things right, to do what she should have done years ago. When she was finished, her hands were shaking so badly it took several tries to slip the letter into inside an envelope. She put on her wool coat, unaware that the remaining minutes of her life were trickling away like water droplets down a drain. She hadn't left the house in days. It was much safer to stay inside, behind barred and bolted doors. But she was going to deliver that letter if it was the last thing she ever did. And, as it turned out, it was. I think we can all agree that the scariest part of real life is working a 9-to-5 job. Hi, my name is Brad Abdul author of the debut novel, The Devil's Advisor, coming in February of 2023. And since we're in full swing spooky season, I thought it would be great if I could share some of the story with you. So sit back, relax, and enjoy The Devil's Advisor. As the bodies all filtered out of the room, glaring at Brian as they passed, Diane packed her things and readied her own exit. He approached her as she was slipping her laptop into its bag. Diane, he asked, can I have a minute? Of course, she looked surprised that he was still in the room. What can I do for you? The regional manager position. I saw that there was a posting from HR about a vacancy. 
I submitted my name for the position, but the application requires supervisory approval in order for consideration. Diane nodded, a considering look on her face. I did see a request come through to my desk. I must say, I was taken aback. You haven't been with the department very long. That's true, but I think that, in my time, I've shown what I'm capable of and that I'm ready for more responsibility, more challenge. You certainly have, Diane chortled. My team's numbers have never been this good. However, I feel like it's not the right time. Brian's heart dipped. He swallowed, blinking rapidly while thinking what possible problems she could have. I've done a good deal for the department. If it's a tenure thing, I'm sure HR would have notified me. Diane shook her head. A full, remorseful look crossed her face. No, no, nothing like that. I think you'd be a wonderful fit for the role, and the firm never stands in the way of self-starters like yourself over something silly like tenure. I just feel like you could benefit from staying in the department for a little while longer so you can really make a name for yourself with the figures you pull in. What's a little while longer? Brian asked, frustrated with the ambiguity. Diane's eyes drifted up in her skull as she pressed a pudgy finger to her chin and thought. I'd say around February would be a good time, she said. How specific. That timeline wouldn't have anything to do with the annual performance bonuses, would it? Brian asked through clenched jaw. Oh my, I hadn't even considered that, Diane replied, not at all convincing. You are making me the envy of other team leaders, though. Best numbers we've had in a long time. Brian's pulse shot up at the reply. Are you telling me that you're actively blocking me from advancement because you'll get a bigger bonus at the end of the year if I stay? I never said anything of the sort, she snapped. How dare you accuse me of something so petty? All the words of rebuttal scrambled in Brian's mind. His mouth opened and closed several times. He wanted to scream, but despite his desire for a well-deserved outburst, he still needed her endorsement. As if answering his dilemma, Diane finished packing her things in a huffy manner. This conversation alone shows me that you need more time to grow in your role. I will not be approving the application. I will inform HR when I return to my desk. She swerved around Brian, leaving him standing in the empty conference room, his own anger smoldering to frustrating defeat. Brian returned to his office in a lingering fog of disbelief. All motivation he had was siphoned out of him during his talk with Diane. His haze carried him through the afternoon and into the early evening, reverting to his phone, spending the rest of the day perusing jobs outside of his consulting firm worth applying for. It wasn't until the sun had nearly set that he realized he should have packed up and left almost an hour ago. He sighed, switched off his seasonal affective disorder lamp and his monitor before standing up and pulling his sport coat from the back of his chair. He heard a click from the door as he pulled his arms through the sleeves. I figured you would have gone home by now, Brian said, assuming it was Amanda at the door. Instead, he saw a man wearing a casual charcoal suit standing in his office. He was young, with short, dirty blonde hair. His features were sharp and handsome, looking as though he were plucked from a magazine cologne ad. Brian's brow furrowed. Was there a meeting he forgot about? The man certainly fit the bill of a young entrepreneur with money to spend on a consulting firm. Brian's mouth started to open, but he was cut short. Brian Lachey, right? The young man asked. Curiosity crossed Brian's face. I'm sorry, did, did we have a meeting scheduled? No, I'm here to collect you for an interview. Brian's heart skipped at the answer. Did Diane have a change of heart? He certainly wasn't prepared for an interview, but he had a knack for winging things like that. Uh, of course, Brian stammered excitedly. He moved around his desk to follow the man from his office, shutting the door on the way out. The pair entered into the grid of cubicles beyond and made their way to the elevators at the other end of the floor. Oh, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Dallas, the man said, spinning quickly to offer Brian a warm smile and a hand. He took it and gave it a sharp shake. Pleased to meet you, he said as he straightened his tie. I don't think I've seen you around before. What, what department do you work in? He stuffed his shirt into his belt. They reached the elevator and Dallas pressed the down button. Oh, I don't work here. Dallas replied pointedly. A dull ding chimed from the elevator. Instead of the car, the doors opened to a wall of brilliant, writhing light, like slow licking flames bleached of their color. The light spilled out from the elevator, blinding Brian for a moment. He stopped at the door, his brow creased, and he reassessed Dallas on the scene before him. What the hell is this? he demanded. Dallas laughed through his nose. Interesting choice of words, he replied. I told you. I'm bringing you to an interview. Brian studied the man. He seemed to be enjoying himself, toying with Brian. I think I'll take the stairs, Brian said, turning to the doors that led to the stairwell. Dallas shrugged. Works for me. 
The door swung open as Brian approached, revealing the same wall of white beyond. Brian was unable to act quick enough, feeling a firm palm press him between the shoulder blades, shoving him through the door and through the screen of flames. And that's it. Your first taste of The Devil's Advisor, coming this February. Make sure to get your hands on a copy and find out how the story ends. Thanks for listening, and happy Halloween. Hello, I'm Gwendolyn Keist, and today I'm going to be reading from the Haunted House Short Stories Anthology. I'm going to be reading from my story, The Woman Out of the Attic. Here's what you know for sure. You won't survive the film. There's no chance a woman like you will live to see the end credits. Heck, you might not even make it through the opening credits. But even if you're dead before the very first frame, that doesn't mean you're gone. There are other ways of being in the picture. You could, for instance, linger like a ghost, there and not there, a whisper in the heroine's ear, a dull ache in the brooding hero's heart. But it's important that you remember, this isn't your story. None of this, not the man, or the glory, or the happy ending, belongs to you. Please don't forget, or the film will have to remind you. Fade in. You blink into existence and wonder where you are, who you are. This could be many different places and you could be many different people. For instance, if the audience is in the mood for propriety and corsets, this could be England in the 19th century and you're the wife tucked away in the attic. Forgotten like a yellowed family photo album or a box of moth-eaten winter clothes. Or, this could be mid-century after the war, with you as a bright-eyed, wanton socialite. Or maybe it's modern day and you're a lonely career girl who isn't eager to be ignored. After all, there's never a lack of women who misbehave in a world desperate to correct them for it. You blink again and regain your bearings. This time, your role is simple. This time, you're already dead. Your husband isn't your husband anymore, and you're haunting his mansion where he's got a new woman at his side, a dewy, ruddy-cheeked bride. She might have a name. She probably won't. Or if she does, he'll never use it. Instead, he'll call her what she means to him. Beloved. Wife. Mine. For what it's worth, she knows your name. As she wanders the long corridors alone, your name brands itself on her tongue, though she never speaks it aloud. That, of course, won't stop her from speaking about you. I hear she was very beautiful his bride whispers, and the staff members on the estate nod and hurry about their business. This is what you've come to expect. Your beauty is the one thing everyone remembers about you. It was all you had to offer. You were never a nice girl. You laughed too loudly. You stayed out until dawn. You enjoyed sex and sometimes not with your husband. If his new bride wants to do better than you, she should be a good little wife and stop with the questions now. But perhaps she isn't as docile as they think. The bride keeps asking, and everyone keeps pretending they don't know what she's talking about, especially her new husband. Do you grow roses on the grounds? She asks him at dinner, and he bristles on instinct. Absolutely not, he says with a snuff, and doesn't elaborate, doesn't tell her how he hacked down your dozen rose bushes the day after your funeral, his palms blistered and his face burnt and twisted in the sun. At the other end of the long table, his bride blushes and regards her plate of sirloin and wilted asparagus. That's strange, she says. I swear I smell them everywhere I go here. At this, he slams down his wine glass, the jagged shards shattering across the scarlet tablecloth. He storms off without another word, and with dinner abruptly over, she sneaks off to the study where she cries alone at a blackened hearth. You ripple through the walls after her. You aren't a very good ghost. A ghost would haunt this young girl, terrify her in this moment of grief. All you want to do is comfort her, though you don't know how. As you watch her in the lamplight glow, she reminds you of someone. The gap between her teeth, the way her hair falls over her eyes. You barely remember who you are, but somehow you remember her. Films can play tricks on you, 
they can cast the same person in two roles or reincarnate someone just for kicks, just to drive the knife in deeper. You do your best to avoid her, to avoid remembering, but she senses you in the house. She's the only one who seems to know you're still here. When he retires to bed in his separate room each night, she whispers to the high-up cornices on the ceiling. What do you want? She asks, her voice sweet as candy floss, but trembling too. I'll give you anything, anything except him. You try to tell her you don't want him and she shouldn't want him either, but you're dead and nobody listens to the dead. As she sleeps, you smooth her hair and you hum her a lullaby to help her through a nightmare. In the darkness, she calls out his name, not yours, as though he's the one here to comfort her. Then she returns to dreaming. You pretend you can still dream, too. On a lonely winter morning, you stumble upon her in the wardrobe that was once yours. It's filled with her satin gowns purchased in expensive boutiques in the Champs-Élysées. You know because those are the same places he took you on your honeymoon. She runs her fingers along the tailored seams. I don't belong here, she says. At first you think she's talking to herself, until you realize she's speaking to you. His bride is having a conversation with a ghost. You part your lips to respond, but no sound comes out. Flashback. In every version of the film, one thing is a constant. You always ask yourself the same question. How did I die this time? Maybe it was in an accident. That's if you're lucky. More than likely, your end was something much more sinister. A coarse hand around your neck a dollop of rat poison in your high tea. So long as you got what was coming to you. It's a lesson every girl learns early. Strange women, disobedient women, never claw their way to a happy ending. They put their heads in ovens or stones in their pockets. They swallow lie. They wrap a rope around their throats instead of waiting for a hand to come along and do the job for them. Or they take the hard way out like you did. They marry a man who everyone loves and wait until the day he no longer loves them. The film will be halfway over before he makes his confession to his bride. The midpoint is the perfect time for a Byronic man to spew his secrets to a woman who shouldn't have to listen. But you always listen, because until he speaks it aloud, you aren't completely certain how you die. Hi, I'm Christy Nogle, and I'm going to read a story that is going to appear in my collection, The Best of Our Past, The Worst of Our Future from Flame Tree Press in February, 2023. The story is called, You Will Make Me Strong Again. Four nights are gone by on the island before I begin to see you. My consciousness shudders, falls into place. It's just dusk, we're on the beach making sand castles. What did you eat? You look green, you say. You were 10, 12, dressed in a saggy yellow bikini and a torn white t-shirt. You're using a big gulp to make towers on your castle. My legs crossed in front of me, torso slumped. I'm pressing down a channel of wet sand to make a moat. My body is my body, no magical youthening for me. I'm skinny and dehydrated, crepe creased and shiny with dead skin. I said, what did you eat, you say? It was a coconut, I say. I crawl back to the tide pool and get a handful of water. It will take hours to fill the moat this way, which is good. It wasn't, you say, because coconuts aren't pink or sickle-shaped. Coconuts have hairy skins, not spines. It wasn't the kind you get at the store, but it was a coconut. It tasted like coconut, I say. I look up at you, but you are gone. The water inside them was heaven, I say. And there had not been one coconut. There had been dozens, and I'd spilled some of the water back out on the beach, but not all of it. Some of the water was still inside me, making me strong. The tough yellow coconut meat was inside me, making me warm. It would keep me warm all night. Six days are gone by before I see you in the morning light. We swim together and walk the beach. I haven't found anything new from the plane in days, but you do. 
You show me where to find two bottles of water, a pack of peanuts, a hairbrush. I brush my hair for the rest of the morning, pretending it's you doing it for me. The hair is coated in grease and salt, it's sticky. You tell me it's never looked so healthy though, it's becoming something new. I braid it and tie the braid in a complicated knot. Like a winsome mermaid, you say. You don't come with me when I go to find food. There's plenty to eat now, the pink coconuts and something like a clam, crab, greens if I go deeper inland, berries I don't dare touch. I feel thirsty sometimes, but it's not my body's thirst. The coconuts quell that. It's the nostalgic kind, the thirst for a big gulp, and the thirst for an iced glass of beer. I pass the heap of scrub concealing your body, the nest. On my way back to the beach, I try to avoid this place, but the island is small. I come to it from different angles, unexpected, and I jump each time. I don't look, don't see that your arm has dropped out of the nest, don't see the spiders crawl across their discolored hands. I don't see how the bodies under yours have softened and shifted and spilled out. We were going to have such a good time, I say, back at the beach. What do you mean, you say? You're in your 20s, felt but awkward, doing your yoga poses. You have no balance. You know, I say, drinks and dancing, hang out by the pool, maybe meet a sexy stranger. We didn't ever get there, you say? I thought we did. No, you're right. We got there, our vacation destination. We got there six or eight times in our lives. We got there, just not this time. You're right, I say, we were lucky. Are lucky, you say. You try that move your, with your leg outstretched behind you, your arms pointed forward, and you fall on your face and roll in the sand and laugh. I never see you at night. At night, I make up my own nest. It's built of clothes and sand and scrub, just like yours. I think I won't sleep. Every night I think that, but sleep comes hard and quick. I wake to another warm morning, sand and spit on the side of my face. I never see you at night until I do. It's the other you, twisted and torn. You guide the others away from me, the group of you crawling up out of your nest. It's midnight or something like that. All of you lurching up and out and going deeper inland away from me, going after what, I don't know. I should be sleeping. I thought I was sleeping, but I wasn't. I was watching that spot for movement. Maybe I caused you to wake with my watching. The days are formless. I don't know how many have gone by. You must sleep all day now. You're never with me. I eat what I can, but it's getting harder to keep things down. I stop at your nest. Animals have torn it over these nights and some are still here, too brazen to scatter. They circle and slide underneath. I look at you for the first time, the purple and blue and green and the pink of what lies there, the shimmery movement all wondrous like a sunset crossed by flocks of birds. My own limbs have grown purple as yours. I'm cold all the time. You don't come near me until you do. At midnight, you claw up out of the nest and this time seem to catch my scent on the air. I see you stop and turn, you and your crew. I've been watching that spot and I thought I'd been sleeping. You come to me quicker than anything all of you rushing over rocks and sand. You're here at my side, kneeling. The others hang back. I don't know them. My pulse at the sight of you rises and falls in a rush, like going over a waterfall. You're holding out your hand to me. You are real and you are beautiful. Hi, I'm Shamiz Patel Papathanasio, author of fantasy novel, the Last Feather, and I'll be reading an excerpt from the second book in the trilogy, The Eternal Shadow, which has been tweaked slightly to avoid any spoilers. The thick air of the forest burned like acid in his throat. He glanced around, locating everyone. I'm going to walk, 
Lucas said, sliding off the horse and offering it to his mother, who looked to be dead on her feet. Every day that passed by recently seemed to age her by a year. I'm fine, thank you, darling. Cassia, you seem tired, his mother said. Would you like to ride? Cass chugged water and wiped her mouth with the back of her hand. I'm fine, thank you. A fox scurried across his path and he looked up in time to see the glint of a spider web before him. He ducked underneath, but Zoe walked straight into it and took a few seconds to rub it off his skin. Beyond where they stood, only small slits of light peeked through the treetops. Lucas struggled to inhale, as if the oxygen in this forest was owned by the looming trees. Cass stumbled, and before she could hit the ground, he grabbed the back of her tunic and pulled her to her feet. Not the best save, but it did the job. Something's wrong, Cass said, blinking rapidly. I feel like I'm going to pass out. You haven't slept. She mumbled, but he couldn't hear her. Neither could anyone else. They paused, leaning in to hear what she had to say while the horses whirled around anxiously. No, she said, widening her eyes in a way that she'd do when she was falling asleep in class. I'm tired, but it's not from sleeplessness. With shaking hands, she took out the water skin and poured it onto her face. I feel like I'm being stated. She wrung her hands out and as she closed her eyes, she shuddered in the way his mother did whenever she'd had a vision. Cass's eyes flung open. What did you see? His mother asked as she dismounted her horse. Bree slid off as well, her eyes full of concern. The Lithilia. I keep seeing it. Cassia said, forcing her eyes wide open. Her voice shook with panic as she spoke. It wants to know who I am. Ardell moved suddenly behind Lucas. He spun around to see Ardell grabbing the horse with Lucy on it and whispering to it. The horse broke into a gallop as soon as he released the reins. What are you doing? His mother asked. Don't you hear that? Ardal said, spinning around and unsheathing his knife. Nisa and Minjun slipped off their horse and everyone listened. Lithilia, Lithilia, Lithilia. The sound that had been described to him numerous times increased in volume from every direction echoing and bouncing off trees. The shadows swirled from the depth of the forest, blocking out the silver sunlight that had remained until they were all clouded in darkness. He felt the ice-cold faceless thing wrap around his body. He felt it drip along his skin and then he felt the pain. Before he screamed, he heard Nisa screaming, her voice breaking as the sound of her shriek tore through him. A white stream in the endless night connected Lucas to the shadow creature around him. Pain carved through him as his body felt as though it were being pulled apart. No, not pulled. Torn, slowly, tugging away at the glue that held him together. He couldn't move. Frozen in pain or terror, it was hard to distinguish between the two as the darkest parts of him overwhelmed his entire being. Lucas pushed his hands forward, forcing his magic out with the intention of throwing the monster backward and creating space to get to his mother. But the shadows swallowed his magic, growing in size, multiplying. More of them appeared, seemingly out of thin air. He pulled out his dagger and rushed forward, diving it through the black entity and splitting it. But it simply rejoined. Two became one and just as easily one became four. It didn't matter. His magic ached within him threatening to break free. He considered giving into it, but he couldn't. He could feel it edging toward the surface, but something was stopping it. He ran to his mother, who scrambled to her feet, fighting them off with her dagger. On his far right, Cass collapsed, likely from exhaustion. The shadows wrapped around her before anyone could reach her. Lucas cut through them in an attempt to get to her. It lifted her off the ground as it had done with him, except there was no white stream of magic connecting them. It spoke, and this time they all heard it. We found you, the thing said to her, its voice resonating as if it came from more places than just one. Come with us. They lifted her up and up to the tops of the trees, and Lucas grabbed the nearest trunk, preparing to climb. 
He pulled himself up a lower branch. He would climb up and reach her. He would jump. But seconds later, blue flames exploded from her body. The shadow disappeared in the light and she was falling. He was low on energy, but it had to work. He raised his hands, summoning his telekinetic magic and cast froze midair. Before he could lower her, the hum of his magic dropped and she fell. Thank you. Hi, my name is Philip Fercasi, and I will be reading today from my short story, Autumn Sugar. Sam hears the screen door open and slap shut. The squeaking hinge is a bird call, as welcoming and familiar as hearing his own name. From behind a jagged line of trees, he watches his father step into the dusky light and walk brusquely toward the teetering shed, away from the house, away from him. He waits for his dad to stop and look around, cup a hand to his mouth and yell, Sam! Anticipating this call, Sam nervously grips the coarse bark of the tree he hides behind, waiting, waiting. But then his father is gone, slipping into nothingness beyond the shed. He's going to the leaf pile. Sam steps away from the tree to better see the distant clearing, ignores the icy teeth of the wind nibbling at his cheeks, its slim, cold fingers curling around the back of his neck where the skin is chafed but now dry. His heart has calmed down, doesn't bounce against his ribs like a thing caged, a swollen and heavy thump, thump, thump in his chest. Now that he's cooled off, it's as if his heart has disappeared completely, comfortably vanished, leaving him clean and empty. The feeling carries to his mind, dulling the memory of his father's rebuke, of striking him in the face, knocking him down. With the passage of time, Sam is able to think clearly of his daddy's heated, hateful eyes, as if from a great distance, with an adult's understanding that it had been only a moment, not a life. Because life is not a single moment, but all the other things. The love, the warmth, the eternity of good nights and good mornings, the small kisses and the long hugs, the protection, the always being there. Sam has a mad, painful rush of affection for his parents, a burst of such strong, raw emotion that he feels like soaring, flying across the earth to them, shouting out that he's home, that he's ready to be forgiven, that he's ready to be loved. Then, as if whispered to him by the fat, full moon, an idea springs into Sam's head. A funny, wonderful idea of how he can win back his father's affection, make things right again, like they used to be, not in one lost moment, but in life, in his life. Grinning, Sam scampers through the trees, careful to be quiet, to stay behind the tree line so his father will not see where he's going, where he will hide. And then, when his dad comes close, comes to do the work, Sam will leap out, and maybe he will roar, bare finger claws. Or maybe he will run and jump into his kneeling father's chest, who will catch him and hold him and lift him, and together, together, they will go home, and it will all be okay. It will be perfect. Margaret calls for Sam from the back door. Charles turns from his work, sweat beating his temples, and leans his weight on the worn handle of the rake. From a distance, Margaret appears to him as a doll, a living doll inside a child's toy playhouse. So idyllic do they appear, this petite woman in her green sweater and dark blue jeans, a bright red scarf in her raven hair, the house seemingly unblemished by time, without rot, without decay. A flawlessness made true by the soft haze of burgeoning twilight. He squints and his gaze leaves his wife, wanders the giant yard, the scattered beginnings of the woods that stretch back acres, some of it their land, most of it owned by the state, but left alone, a preserve. Charles frowns at the darkening sky, the trees now rife with an army of shadows. Sam knows not to go past the creek, he assures himself. The creek is the boy's boundary when playing outside alone, one he never crossed, not to Charles's knowledge, anyway. He'd been raised well, after all. He, he'd he been... Sam! He bellows, not from fear or anxiety, only wanting to help, to parent, to be a good father, a good husband. 
Margaret stands across the breadth of the yard as if pacing an opposite shoreline, the sea a blanket of thick Kentucky blue grass, the expanse a rising swell of blue-green between their two bodies, a rolling wave of stretched hillock that protrudes along the rear of the property. Charles once joked that it must have been an old burial mound. Charles, it's getting dark. He lifts a weary, gloved hand and nods showing that he understands the news found severity of the situation. His wife turns and goes abruptly into the house. Annoyed with me, with my damned temper, with her adventurous son. He sighs, looks around the yard once more, watches the reddening sun cut through its middle, clinging to the horizon as if struggling against the oncoming night, the cunning moon lengthening the already long shadows stretched like taffy from the trees. Sam, he yells, and in the distance, hears barking. Tucker? An unwelcome flutter fills his chest, a jingling bell of worry, the early pangs of panic. Shit, he says, surprised to see the white mist of his breath. He sets the rake against the low cinder block walls surrounding the burn patch, and heads for the sound. As he walks toward the woods, he calls for the dog. The barking comes and goes, but doesn't appear to be moving, and Charles can't help but wonder what the dog is going on about. Maybe he's chased a raccoon up a tree, or a woodchuck into its winter burrow. Or maybe he found Sam. Maybe the boy is hurt, or face down in the creek, head bloodied, cracked open by a wet rock when he slipped, slipped and fallen, and was even now breathing in the rough, cold water. Sam! Tucker! Charles quickens his pace toward the trees. Hello, everyone. My name is Lena Ng, and I'm the author of Last Train Onwards for Flame Trees Asian Ghost Stories. I'll be reading an excerpt from the story. Although set in Japan, the specific locations are fictional and the main protagonist is an elderly man. Last Train Onwards by Lena Ng. We have a legend from where I come from, back in the old country, where there are no skyscrapers or neon lights, where rice paddies are planted by hand and soybeans are seeded in the fields, where over the years, the rural population's youth have drained into, into the city lured away by the call of fortune, taken away by trains. The gardens have given way to weeds and the timbers of the traditional thatched roof houses have rotted, cracked and fallen. More houses stand abandoned than shelter the living. Once vibrant with families, our village had a market, school, community center and izakaya, our version of a pub where skewers of chicken or leeks were grilled over a charcoal fire, the food accompanied by sake or beer. There are only a handful of us left, the ones left behind, now elderly or infirm. More ghosts than people occupy the land. The one-room school has closed, the isekai shuttered, the community hall no longer hosts weddings. I find myself talking to shadows. Our village is located in the Yano Valley, in an isolated mountainous region, one side bounded by the sea. Our sacred mountain, Mount Kenji, stands guard. There is a winding path through the forest to the summit where we go to pray. A shrine was built from red painted columns and prayer scrolls fluttered in the breeze. A pair of statues, sculpted as wide-eyed lion dogs, protect the entrance by warding away evil spirits with their open mouth snarls. Offerings of bowls of rice, apples from our orchards, and flowers such as blue asagao and yellow sunflowers adorned the wooden altar. The scent of incense, their smoke rising to the heavens, lingered in the air. After I visited the shrine, my prayers proceeded by a ring of the bell and a clap of my hands. 
I moved to a clear spot where I could watch the ocean. Sometimes peaceful, sometimes angry, the great waves tumbled with frothing white caps against the cliffs. The boats of the fishermen lilted and turned. They looked like toys. When I was a young man, we still had train service to our village. We were part of the Kebu line, which traveled between Deu and Odesai, bringing those returning home. It was a joy to see the train coming into the station and those who we had not seen in months, their familiar faces. Over the years, the train service was privatized and due to lack of demand, eventually shuttered. Although it has been many years since service to our train station has stopped and the village section of track is no longer in use, occasionally through the thick fog, you can hear the train's whistle. Under the right conditions of wind and pressure, the sound carries from a distance away. When we hear the train's whistle, the few remaining villagers huddle in their houses. But for some, the train's whistle is a call to the final journey. Legend has it that on chill evenings, the ghost train appears. The whistle is first heard, a low grumbling thrum. Then through the dense gray cover, although the air is chill and no fog should form, the dark form of steel and aluminum emerges, rattling the ground. It is said that it looks like a hearse. When it comes to rest at the platform, the doors open as one and they slide open, but no employees appear. No one knows its destination. For those who wish to travel onwards, they get their chance to board. None have ever returned. I guess it goes to a land of shadows where loved ones have gone before. It is on these nights that one by one, the villagers have disappeared. We villagers like to say that the train has taken them away. It is our euphemism for death. It also keeps alive the hope that they will one day return and we can anticipate the joy of reuniting. Mrs. Sato, now in her 80s, but hale and energetic, has taken to creating life-size figures to replace the departed, made from cloth stretched over wire frames and stuffed with straw. They stare at you as they sit along the road or propped up as though they are working in the fields or dressed in their fishing gear. There are more dolls than villagers. Some of them resem resemble deceased family members, while others have no unique characteristics, white-faced and featureless. There are no children here. Instead, there are child-sized dolls, which sit silently in the classroom. Picture books propped open before them with illustrations of octopuses or other creatures of the sea, while their soundless teachers watch over them. Other dolls sit at the bus, bus station where no more buses run. Others gather at the abandoned train station where the train no longer travels. All that remain in our village is silence. It has a strange quality, empty and mournful. This strange type of silence starts after the autumn moon festival, stretches out through the winter, and lifts in the spring. It is like the sound of sleeping. The return of cherry blossoms in spring brings a burgeoning joy, along with the melancholy that their lives, as ours, are short, and the petals will eventually fall like tears. The feeling arises that nothing lasts, the wistfulness of impermanence, the passing of all things, like the ghost train in the night. Our village grows smaller and smaller. Although, although the people are gone, reminders of their presence surround us. I hope you enjoyed this excerpt from my story, Last Train Onwards, and you can read the rest of the story in Flame Tree's Asian Ghost Stories. Thank you. Hello. 
My name is John Everson, the author of The House by the Cemetery, Voodoo Heart, and Five Deaths for Seven Songbirds, all from Flame Tree Press. Tonight I'm going to read an excerpt from the very beginning of Five Deaths for Seven Songbirds, my giallo tribute for you. Um, I hope you'll enjoy it. Her footsteps echoed on the tile floor even though she wore gym shoes. It was that still. The corridors of the old building stood silent and empty, most of the lights out. Eleven o'clock at night was not a popular time for practicing, which was precisely why Jen liked to come here at this time. She had the conservatory all to herself. Once in a while, she might see a light on in one of the professor's offices. Professor von Klein, in particular, often kept late hours, and she knew from experience why. Tonight, however, his office was dark. Jen flipped on the light in the hallway that led to the piano practice rooms and then walked down to room 342. She reserved it at this time every term for three nights a week, not that there was any competition for its use. There wasn't a single note of music echoing anywhere in the building tonight. Hell, half the students weren't in residence yet. It was only August 21st. Lectures and classes for the new term started next week. She turned on the overhead lights and closed the door. The room was small but comfortable, kind of like a den. A black Steinway baby grand dominated the center of space, its lid raised and keys exposed. Jen shook her head. Sloppy. Somebody had not closed it up earlier. There were wooden cabinets that completely took up two walls of the room. The smaller ones held deep piles of music, some of which she was sure dated back to the 1800s after having casually explored the yellowing, sometimes handwritten staffs in the past. Floor-to-ceiling cabinets housed old brass and percussion instruments. Students also used them to hang coats in during the winter months. All of the dark wood made it feel as if you were playing in the study of an old, upscale mansion. Jen dropped her bag on the floor next to the piano bench and fished out the music she brought to practice a list piece that she'd be using to audition for the seasonal soloist competition next Tuesday. She set the music up in the brass-hinged wooden holder, shifted her position, and began to play. She stopped before she reached the end of the first page. Her fingers had stumbled on two sixteenth-note runs. Jen lifted her hands from the keyboard with a grimace. If she did that during the auditions, she was DOA. She took a deep breath, willing herself to focus, and was about to start again when something creaked behind her. Jen swiveled on the bench to stare at the cabinets. Nothing was out of place. The doors were all closed. She got up and looked out of the narrow glass window in the door to the hallway. There was nobody in sight. Jen shrugged and returned to the bench. It was an old building. Old things creaked, she told herself. Still, when she started to play once more, she felt uneasy. As she reached the intricate 16th note runs again, she could have sworn she heard another noise. She made it through the passage, but as soon as she did, she lifted her fingers from the keys. The hair on the back of her neck was standing up. Why? She practiced here all the time at this hour. Why was she spooked over a couple of creaks tonight? Jen closed her eyes and willed the uneasiness away. The building was settling, and she needed to get some work done. Von Klein was a man of many faces. The professor appeared very friendly most of the time, but when he was behind the audition desk, he was a tyrant. That was what she needed to be afraid of, not old joists settling. Jen started the piece once more and was nearly through page two when she abruptly stopped playing. This time, not because she heard, this time, not because she heard something, but because she didn't. She repeated the last measure and sure enough, when she played the low E, there was silence. Odd. She pressed on the key and when there was still no sound, repeated the motion harder and harder. Nope. The lower register E was dead. Weird. It had been fine yesterday. She got up, walked around to the side of the piano, and looked inside to see if something had fallen on the string, deadening it. Hmm, she murmured as she stared at the pristine rows of golden strings. There was a gap in the lower section. 
Someone had cut out a string, but they hadn't even bothered to remove the ends. The orphaned wire ties were still in the holes. What the hell, Jen said. This practice night was not going well. It was about to get much worse. Jen shook her head and went back to the bench. She was going to work for the next hour if it killed her. There were not many days left before the auditions. She made it to the pianissimo section on page four when she heard an extended creak that came from directly behind her. Jen's fingers stopped. She turned quickly. Her heart was beating double time. That increased when she saw that one of the tall cabinet doors was open. It had not been open two minutes ago. As she scanned the room, the overhead lights suddenly went out. The cabinets disappeared in total black. Jen turned towards the door. Something moved in the darkness. A silhouette caught and shifted in the dim light that seeped in through the window from the hall. It looked like a person's head. She almost screamed but stopped herself. There was nobody in the building close enough to hear her cry for help. But there was definitely somebody in the practice room with her. Somebody who apparently meant her harm. Jen shifted her feet around to the side of the bench. She didn't know what the other person intended, but it couldn't end well. If she could slip behind the body of the piano, she would have a straight shot to bolt for the door. It was a long run to the front entry of the building, but she'd been on the track team in high school. That gave her a fighting chance. Her stomach filled with ice and her legs felt frozen, but Jen forced her body to move, to rise from the bench, despite the paralyzing fear. She had to get away. As she stood, something abruptly pinched her neck and yanked her off her feet. Jen collapsed to the bench, which rocked dangerously, teetering on the brink for just a moment before toppling completely. Her whole body spilled to the floor. The impact of her tailbone on the wood made her open her mouth to cry, but the pinch on her neck tightened to a throttling tourniquet that choked any sound away. All that came out was a gurgle. The pressure around her throat tightened. Her eyes bugged out as the force cut off her oxygen. Jen lashed out with her fist, punching in angry desperation at the air all around her. She connected with something firm, maybe a shoulder. The noose around her neck drew ever tighter. She stopped her attack and instead reached to the back of her neck to try to pry whatever was around her throat away. Her fingers gripped the noose. It was cold and thin, metallic. It cut into the skin of her fingertips, and she couldn't loosen it at all. As death stars blossomed across her vision, Jen realized too late what had become of the missing piano string. There was a blinding flash of light, and then a voice finally whispered in the returning dark, Live by the piano, die by the piano, it said. And that is the end of the prologue of Five Deaths for Seven Songbirds. Thanks for listening. My name is Reggie Oliver, and uh, this is an extract from my story, The Black Ship, which appears in the volume Weird Horror, published by the Flame Tree Press. In the story, certain rather sinister old manuscripts are discovered, among them the logbook of a Captain Reynolds, master of a ship called the Speedwell, which uh, sailed from America to America in the autumn of 1620. On board is an odd selection of passengers, and the owner of the ship, a Mr. Morby, who commands Captain Reynolds, much against his will, to land at a strange island in the Atlantic. Uh, this is from the captain's log, dated October the 7th, 1620. October the 7th. In this day I thought we might set sail, but Master Morby came to me and said that there was one thing most necessary to be done, and for this he required the strength and the skills of myself and my men. He told me that at the top of the island was a stone which he wished to be removed and placed in the ship to take to the Americas. He said that it required the strength and skill of my men to transport this object by means of ropes and other devices. 
I protested most strongly that neither I nor my men were contracted to service the random desires of anyone aboard, and that, uh, besides, I knew not if my vessel would sustain the weight of such an object. Then Morby stared at me and said that any disobedience to my, his commands would go very ill with me. I therefore gave instructions to my men, who were much astonished at my commands, but made no murmur of complaint. And so, with six of my crew, a quantity of rope, and other necessary accoutrement, I stepped onto the island again, accompanied by Master Morby and a few of the more able-bodied passengers. I was struck most forcibly by the alien and unnatural quality of this island's features. The rocks of which it was chiefly composed were of a greenish hue, but not from moss or vegetation, but like the verdant marble so highly prized by the men of Italy. Yet I have never seen such stone in such abundance before, and it seemed to have been shaped by cunning hands. We followed the path of smooth, flat stones like the pavement of some great palace or temple, which led ever upwards between great clefts in the rock. I noted but few plants growing there, and saw no creatures, not even so much as a seabird, but nevertheless the isle was full of voices. Strange cries echoed among the surrounding stones, and yet not like the voice of any man or beast that I have yet heard before. It filled me and my men with great dread, so that I asked Mar M Master Morby what they might be. He replied that they were not the cries of men or beast, but were caused by the exhalations of air through clefts in the rock, and that these exhalations came from very deep caverns beneath the island. I could scarce credit his theory, but held my peace. As we wound upwards, I began to see many curious signs and figures carved into the surrounding rocks. Again, in wonderment, I asked Bobby what these might be, and he told me that they were marks left by a very ancient people, but would say naught further. At length we arrived at the summit of the isle, where upon a kind of platform of stone stood a black rock, smooth and polished, carved in co into a conical pillar, with its topmost part level, and with many strange devices inscribed upon it. Upon the topmost part of this black stone was a carven figure, which struck me with much confusion and terror. It was crouched upon a seat of alabaster, though it was composed of smooth stone of a dark green like the deep shade of a cypress tree. Its eyes were made of milk-white moonstones, and all manner of writhing serpents flowed from its hideous visage, as if they were limbs. The skill and art of the limner had truly been put to the service of hell itself in the making of that image. Master Morby commanded that uh, this monstrous object be taken down from its pinnacle and transported most reverently to the ship. My men professed the greatest reluctance to have anything to do with the removal of this hellish idol, but Morby was insistent, and I promised goodly measures of strong drink to those who would aid in this endeavour. My men obeyed, but with an ill grace. As the idol, as I may call it, was being taken down from its exalted post, I heard many murmurs and strange cries among those of our passage who had come up with us to the place. One of them, known to us all as Mother Demdike, a most pestilential ancient, lifted up her skirts and began to dance, cackling and keening as she did so. Few fouler spectacles have I ever beheld than that toothless crone capering on the summit of such a barren and accursed isle. But her other companions paid no heed. The idol was lowered into a kind of wooden chariot our carpenter had devised for transporting to the ship. 
When this was done, and the idol was safely stowed aboard, it was dawn of the October the 8th. At once, Morby commanded me to set a course, and gave me instructions as to which I had no choice but to submit to his demands. October the 8th. As the sun rose over the island, we left our anchorage. It was bright day with a fair wind, and as we came out to the open sea, I heard again those sounds that the island gave out, like unto mournful hollowing from its depths. Then a most strange and astonishing event occurred. We were about a league from the island when I looked back upon it, and it appeared to me to be smaller than was just. I kept my eye upon it and saw that the whole island was sinking into the waves. The beach where we had feasted but one day previous was gone completely under the waves, but this was no mere tide, for the isle was sinking fast. The sea began to close over the cliffs and crags, whither but yesterday we had climbed with much labour. As the land sank, a mist was borne upwards like the steam from the clefts of the rocks, and it was coloured grey and green. Presently we could see only the topmost spire of that mysterious congery of rocks, then with a final exhalation of green smoke and what sounded like a melancholy sigh, the whole sank beneath the waves, which bubbled a while and then was still. All that was left was a wreath of greenish fog which hung like some foul garland above the place where the island had been before it was dissolved by the winds. I dared not ask Master Morby what manner of place it was we had visited. I read once in an old book that there be certain mouths of hell on this earth such as at Hecla in Iceland, where the ghosts of dead men are familiarly seen and sometimes talk with the living, and where lamentable screechings and howlings are continually heard. Moreover, fiery chariots are commonly seen to bring the souls of men in, like in the likeness of crows, and devils ordinarily go in and out. Truly, I believe this was such a place, yet more like it was not a mouth of hell, but hell itself that we had visited. Hello, I'm Ramsay Campbell, and I'm going to read you an excerpt from my new novel, Fell Stones. In it, Michael, the uh, narrator, remembers what he describes as the worst terror of his childhood. Believe me, there are some candidates. Michael felt he owed Adele a new game. He was looking to the village green and the patiently motionless stones for inspiration when he glimpsed movement in the hedge. He tried to keep his eyes on the spot as he crossed the lawn, but lost sight of it before he reached the hedge. He hadn't previously noticed how complicated the hedge was, a labyrinth of twigs and thorns and glossy leaves. As he peered into its tangled depths, it seemed to reach for glimpses of the fell stones. He brought his face as close to the hedge as he could without risking a scratch, and the object he'd seen groped forth to meet him. It had too many fingers. No, those were legs, but a dismayingly unequal number. It was a spider, far too close to the size of the hand Michael jerked up to fend it off. Its seven legs ranged over his palm as if they had a message for him, and then it snatched them out of sight. His reaction said to be sprawling on his back. A performance Adele rewarded with a giggle. What are you doing that for? It was the biggest spider, didn't you see? No, I want to. Where is it? When Michael struggled to his feet, he saw a shape scuttling across the road. The hedge must be confusing his vision, because its legs appeared to be longer and thinner, its body hardly there at all. It's going on the green, he said. Let's catch it, Adele urged, and ran out of the gate. Through the hedge he saw the lopsided shape wobble across the green towards the midpoint of the fell stones, where it vanished. 
He was confused by the notion that it had grown as it retreated. Otherwise, how could he have seen it at that distance? When he hesitated at the gate, Adele demanded, Where is it, Michael? Don't know. I just saw you seeing. You have to show me. He couldn't let her realise he was nervous, but when he led the way across the green, he was relieved to see no sign of it on the grass Mr Griswell mowed every month. It's gone. Then you have to call it. You're the one it showed. This was an odd way to put it, but Michael felt bound to make up for spoiling their rockery game. Spider, he called too low to be heard beyond the green, and then spidery. The extra letter seemed appropriate somehow, as if it was trying to summon a creature only approximately like a spider. Perhaps this just meant it was short of a leg, but the call didn't ring it, however often he repeated the word. As he and Adele raged about in search of the spider, he could have imagined that the stones had begun to lean surreptitiously inwards, like legs clutching at their prey. His eyes must be growing tired of the hunt, and so was he. When was Adele going to let him give up? The word was starting to feel like a chant set to the note the Staveses had tried to make him sing, in which case the three syllables meant it would never end. He could imagine he and Adele were dancing to the chant, and he would have told her to stop if the repetitions of the word had given him a chance. It was her mother who intervened, calling from the gate, Come in now, you two, dinner! Could they really have been playing all that time? He wouldn't even have called it a game. As he made with a good deal of relief for the house, he thought he heard grass rustling behind him, but saw no movement when he glanced back. It must have been a breeze, since the surreptitious activity had sounded almost as wide as the village green. Dinner was a curry too timid to keep him awake when he went to bed. Remembering his chant did, and trying to hush it only rendered it more dogged. Spidery, 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 spidery. It was a maze with no way out, like the one Adele had made him follow on the green between the stones. Eventually, the repetition put him to sleep. But did it persist in a dream? It was still in his head when he woke in the dark. What had wakened him? The impression of a series of faint sounds brought to mind the play of fingers on a keyboard bereft of strings a succession of dry clicks. He was struggling sleepily to decide what notes the strings would have produced when he heard the sounds again tapping on glass. His eyes wavered open and then trembled wide. A hand was groping over his window, the window in the roof. Four silhouetted members reached up the sloping pane, followed by too many more as the intruder heaved its body into view. Once again he'd mistaken it for a hand, and he felt as if it brought it back by wanting to placate Adele. As it slithered to the middle of the window, its obscurely arranged limbs stretched nearly to the edges of the glass. How had it grown so huge? Suppose its weight broke the pane. The silhouette took on more detail. Michael could have thought the stars at the tips of its limbs had brightened, and he saw it wasn't outside the window. Far too much like an instant response to his thought, the shape relinquished its hold on the glass and dropped to the boards with a large, soft thud. Michael tried to keep all of himself utterly still, not least his breath, but it shook as much as the rest of him. It was strange to hear any other movement in the room, but he saw it instead. Thin objects had started to creep up the walls, twitching towards the night sky. The pair that flanked his bed looked eager for a prize, and he was appalled to think this might be him. Though he was growing desperate to call for help, he seemed to have almost no words. Spidery! he cried at the top of his voice, which left him feeling pitifully childish and even more endangered, because it sounded like a further invitation to the trespasser. The solitary, the solitary alternative he found was a scream. He was terrified that nobody would hear, that it would simply attract the intruder. Thin limbs groped all around him as if they were impatient to converge on him. He heard a door open and prayed he'd wakened Rafe or Winifred, but it was Adele who called, "'You having a dream up there, Michael?' "'No,' Michael cried, far more than just an answer to her question. "'Was that Michael?' Winifred said, and he heard the grown-up's door open. "'What did he say, Adele?' "'He's not having a dream.' This rendered his plight yes more de this rendered his plight yet more dismayingly immediate. 
He heard Rafe murmuring as he came out of the bedroom. The nurse of the Staveleys left Michael desperate to be with them, whatever he might have to brave. He flung the quilt off the bed with a loose thud, dauntingly reminiscent of the sound the intruder's fall had made, and he was fearfully drawn more attention. Then the limbs raging about the room jerked out of sight, and the invader scurried to the trap door in the floor. In a moment an object thumped to the landing, and Winifred gave a cry, not quite a scream. "'Let it out, Rafe,' she urged. Footsteps hurried downstairs, and Michael fancied they were covering up the sounds of another descent. They were all he heard before the front door opened and almost immediately shut. His toenails caught the quilt as he stumbled to the window. Starlight seemed to glimmer on the fell stones, and he thought he glimpsed an incompletely leggy shape shrinking into invisibility as it floundered across the green. But he was distracted by Adele's apologetic voice that was scarcely audible. I made Michael call on the green. No harm done, is the Rafe? I hope not. Lower still, Rafe said, just leave these things to the grown-ups, Adele. We don't want him disturbed. A door shut and the ladder up to Michael's room began to creak. Are you all right now, Michael? Rafe called. I'm good. Michael retreated to the bed and hauled the quilt over himself. It was only a dream after all. He shouted loud enough to halt Rafe on the ladder. Even more than he wanted to believe this, he was anxious that the Staveleys should think he did, because he was afraid to ask what they'd meant just now. The creaks retreated, and the grown-up's bedroom door closed, but Michael couldn't give up listening for unwelcome sounds until at last sleep came for him. Not only fear was keeping him awake, he had a sense that everybody in... Th he had a sense that everybody else in the house knew a secret. And perhaps it was a secret about him. Hi, I'm Anastasia Garcia, and I'm the author of Dark Skies from the Weird Horror Anthology from Flame Tree Press. Today, I'm going to be doing a reading of my short story so you can get a sense of how it feels. Here is the Weird Horror Anthology. It's beautiful. And you can find my short story on page 150. Check me out. Today we're going to be reading about two World War II female pilots who were sent on a dangerous mission and encounter something otherworldly. Rosie is escorted to the tarmac for the mission, flanked on either side by high-ranking officers. I watch her suit up and climb into the cockpit before I slink back to the command room where all radio communications will take place. I position myself near the backup aircraft comm in the corner of the room, a clear line of sight to the unfamiliar officers stationed in the front of the room and within earshot of the radio. At first, all is quiet, only the soft hiss of static on the radio. As Rosie gains altitude and speed, she signals all clear into the radio and I let out a shaky breath. As Rosie nears the coordinates of the mission, the ground team frets at their instruments, shouting questions, sharing readouts. A storm begins to build in her flight path, a strange occurrence since no weather patterns predicted a storm of this magnitude now swelling across the sky towards Rosie. The unfamiliar officers, unsettlingly calm, jot notes in their folder. The ground team requests an immediate return to base, but the officers void the call. The ground team continues to insist. They gesture wildly at their instruments. My palms begin to sweat, eyes darting between the ground team lobbying for Rosie's return and the officer's outright refusal. Until the sound of Rosie's voice fills the room. There's something out there. Her once rational voice now sounds feverish, yelling over the thunder and the rain pelting her windscreen. It's too big, it's huge. Machines in the control room begin to whistle and beep. Men jump to action, consulting their figures, making adjustments. My instruments are not functioning. I can't get an accurate reading. The ground control team attempts to ask her questions to discern her location and altitude, but strangely, Rosie's voice lilts and it begins to slur as if she's talking in her sleep. I hear it speaking. The machines slow their beeping and all ears are tuned to Rosie's voice. My heart is pounding. My fists are painfully clenched at my sides as I hold my breath. A sound like a thousand screams erupts from the radio. 
Everyone in the control room yells and covers their ears. The cacophony almost drowns out thought. Until silence. All radio communication blips off and the machines power down. Everyone in the room freezes, waiting in the darkness. The silence lasts only a brief, pregnant moment until the power returns with a rising hum. And in an instant, Rosie is shouting over the radio. She's taken some sort of enemy fire. She's making a hasty return to base, requesting a medic. There's a frenzy of movement as everyone rushes to the exits to see her landing with their own eyes. All tactical units and medical personnel converge on the tarmac to watch her bumpy return to Earth with the sickening sound of scraping metal. Sparks alight her tires as the motor puddles off, the plane slowing to a stop at an angle. The sides of her P-51 Mustang are scorched black and riddled with scratches, as if she's piloted through hell itself. Rosie is pulled nearly unconscious from the still smoking cockpit and hurried to the medical ward. Gripped by concern and curiosity, I sneak a seat behind the nurse's desk and listen in on the uniformed men as they confer outside of Rosie's hospital room. I catch snippets of too dangerous, the anomaly, a greater threat passes their lips. When the officers change their shift, I take this chance to soundlessly enter Rosie's room, closing the door behind me. In the darkened room, Rosie is staring out the window at the blackened night sky. Rosie, I ask, uncertain if she is responsive or in pain. She turns to look at me. Her eyes are clouded with the sedative. I rush to her side to hold her hand. Rosie, are you all right? What happened up there? All I could hear on the comms were screams. I shake the memory of the sound from my mind. Margie, I saw something up there, not human things. The words pull her from the sedative stupor and her eyes shine bright and focused, searching for something beyond her field of vision. They're coming. She hisses between clenched teeth. Her lip trembles with terror as she squeezes my hand in a vice grip. The war, the death, and all the death that will come, it calls to them. Her voice rising, she begins to shake as a bone clattering shiver racks her body. Make it stop, make it stop. She begins to flail just as nurses and officers rush back into the room. My eyes are wide, staring at Rosie, fighting the hands pinning her down. The frenzied look in her red rimmed eyes and the splittle flying from her lips. In the chaos, I slip out as Rosie begins to scream. Well, that was a short snippet from Dark Skies found in the Weird Horror Anthology from Flame Tree Press. Thanks. Hello, my name is Jonathan Jans, and I will be reading a very short excerpt from a story in the anthology Close to Midnight. Uh, the story is called Room for the Night. I'll be censoring it slightly. Um, <laughs> there are some semi-shocking elements in it. It's a horror story after all. Um, and it's a story that's partially about lust, but it's mostly about um, things that are fairly universal and I think pretty scary. So let's just start at the beginning and I'll read about a page and a half from it. And thank you so much for being here. And um, <laughs> here we go. Mr. Nelson looks at me and says, I almost had sex with a cat once. I start toward the door. Now don't get all high and mighty on me, he calls. I never did it. I said I thought about it is all. This isn't worth it. Is it worth, boy, do you know how long I had to work when I was your age to scrape up 20 bucks? I frown. How old are you anyways? 56. I note how the living room curtains turn his pale skin a drab dill pickle hue. See the sparse downy hairs clinging to the liver spotted wasteland of his scalp. The pouchy eye sockets and the overlarge nose. Mr. Nelson looks closer to 96 than 56, but whatever. His money will fill up my gas tank as well as anyone's. I sigh. I'll give you a few more minutes, but you gotta pay me 30. Done. And no more cat screwing stories. I never did. 
I exhale heavily and wander back to the ratty calico couch. Mr. Nelson eases into his duct-taped recliner. She was a big white cat. Had this silky coat. I start to rise again. Wait, he pleads. Simmer down. For this to work, I gotta tell you some stuff. For what to work? I'll get to that, he says. Just please, sit. I do, reluctantly. I was drunk that night, he says, eyes glittery. I was alone, like usual, and Laura, she was sitting beside me purring. Your cat was named Laura? What's wrong with that? Laura's not some, sorry, Laura's not th something you name a cat. It's something you name a daughter. Well, this one was named Laura, and she was the best damn cat I ever had. He watches me to see if I'll argue, but I don't. The quicker I get this over with, the quicker I can get to Catherine's. But to do that, I have to gas up my car, and my parents aren't helping. I get one B+, plus and they act like the world's ending and deprive me of my allowance until I prove I'm applying myself. Hence the reason I'm sitting here with a cat screwer. I've been drinking quite a bit, he says, and shoots me a quick, crafty look. More than usual, anyway. And I was watching this movie about a guy who falls in love with a mannequin. I forget the name. Mannequin? He snaps his fingers. That's it! It had the lady from Porky's. What's her name? I make a speeding up gesture. Anyhow, the movie had a happy ending, and I got choked up. There was this song. I think it was Jefferson Airplane. And I started in thinking, damn it, it's good that people find each other sometimes. In this case, it was a dude finding a mannequin, but that's not the point. They found each other. His eyes take on a bleary look. He has a six-pack of natural light beside him, five cans empty, but I don't think it's the alcohol misting him up. I know how pitiful this sounds, he goes on, but some people, they never find somebody. I remember back when I was your age, staying home on Friday nights and asking my mom why no girl was interested in me. A lost look seeps into his eyes. Mom said, they will, Buster. They will be. One of these days when you come into your own. I listen, a little disconcerted. I didn't know his name was Buster. To me, he's always been Mr. Nelson, the weird old drunk from down the street. But now, knowing his first name, picturing him as a teenager, alone, I don't like knowing that. He shakes his head, gazing into the past. Even then, I remember thinking, what if I don't come into my own? What if I stay like this? The type of guy no one wants to hang out with. He looks at me with those pleading wet eyes, and I think, hell, no amount of money is worth this. So I'm on the couch, he goes on, and there's Laura, just gazing up at me and purring, looking at me the way that mannequin lady looked at Rob Lowe in the movie. Please stop, I think, bile percolating in the back of my throat. So I start to pet Laura, and she pushes into my hand the way she always did. And it was a moment, you know? That song playing on the TV, that cat, my best friend in the world looking at me the way no one ever had. And I thought, why not? Just why the hell not? Holy crap. Mr. Nelson, Buster, he corrects and leans forward to clap a hand on my knee. When he sees how I tense, he shows me his palms. Now, don't freak out. I'm not Jeffrey Dahmer. I'm not entirely convinced, but whatever. The clock is ticking, and every moment brings me closer to milkshakes and burgers for me and Catherine. What then? I ask. He shrugs. Went upstairs and tried to sleep it off. That's when the trouble began. He glurgs some beer and stares into the can. That's when the trouble always begins. I can tell he's building up to something. And for reasons I can't explain, I'm dreading this more than some feline sex confession. In a scarcely audible voice, he asks, You ever get scared at night? 
Sure. He doesn't smile. Doesn't look up. I don't mean normal scared. I don't mean scared of the dark or the wind. And I think that's where we will pause. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for listening to this excerpt. I hope you read the rest of the story. I hope you read the whole anthology. It is fantastic. So many wonderful writers in there. It's just an honor to be included with them. So thank you, Mark Morris, for including my story in that. Thank you, Flame Tree, for having me here tonight. I hope you all have a beautiful rest of the evening. Peace. Hi, my name is Shane Hawk, and I'm enrolled in the Cheyenne Arapaho Tribes of Oklahoma. Today I'll be reading an excerpt, or a teaser, of my story called Imitate, which originally was published in my short story collection, Anoka. Hope you enjoy. The lamps I tossed into the crawl space covered much of the area, but left some corners dark. Those corners radiated the type of darkness so black your eyes see patterns and figures that aren't really there. Or were they? I saw more of those tiny spirals in one particular corner. Some spirals emitted a faint green light that grew stronger with my every movement. With my limited space, I moved onto my back and fumbled in my pocket for my mini flashlight, clicked it on, and tilted my head wet backward. My gape mouth let out a shrill scream. I flipped back onto my stomach, convulsing, bubbling, popping. There were seven, maybe eight rats, all melted together. Their mouths opened in unison, and another deep-toned screech infiltrated my eardrums. All three of my lights went out, and a resonant humming filled my head. My body didn't thrash about, and I didn't make for the exit. I just lay there on my stomach in an all-consuming stupor. The melted pile of half-dead rats gave off a fetid stench of death, which strong-armed my nostrils. I dealt with rat carcasses often, but the stinging scent was overpowering. Remnants of my breakfast shot out of my throat with little effort. With bile coating my lips, a forced smile grew and my eyes became lost in the shifting spirals of various colors. There was a large movement at the center of the rat pile. It was pulsating much more than before, but jutting out toward me. It wriggled and let out somber cries. A creature broke through the melted rats. It was my son. He was squeezing out of the sickly mess of rats, a jelly-like substance smeared across his face. Could only guess it was a mixture of the rats' innards. By the time he was halfway through the rats, I scooted my body that much further toward the exit. I wondered if my coworker sprayed chemical compounds in there before he left. Was I suffering brain damage and hallucinating? Dread flooded my veins and wormed its way into my brain paralyzing me in a state pinned between fight or flight. Daddy, it hurts, Tate said, or the thing that looked like Tate. It was as if he was crawling through a glue trap I often set for rats. So slow. The colored spirals were dancing around him and in an instant fell away, vanished. Steam came off his body like the morning coffee pot we shared. Then... His skin. It was as if he, his old skin got caught on a nail, stretched out, and reached its ultimate point of tension before ripping away. I remembered seeing a time-lapse video showing a tarantula leaving its old skin behind for a new set of furry feelers. It was simultaneously captivating and revolting, but this, this was just revolting. Dry heaves developed into more vomiting up my breakfast, the Tate thing crawled through it anyway. With every move it made, I slid back an equal distance. The new skin was an older Tate, a teenage Tate, still slim but with long dark hair and peach fuzz across his upper lip. Dad, just let me go. You can't save me. His voice was deeper, more pronounced. He coughed and black slime spilled from his mouth. Quiet, angry curse words swam under my breath as I struggled to keep my distance and get the hell out of there. I reached the entryway of the crawl space and sprang to my feet, knee joints cracking like thunder. The moonless night startled me. I started this job around three o'clock. How long was I inside there? It felt like minutes. 
I watched the entryway for the take creature to follow. It didn't. Whoa, buddy, easy there. Rogers warned as I spun around and almost knocked him over. Did you finish up the house? Though it was a brisk night, sweat seeped from my armpits and forehead. A quick swipe of my brow only got a small portion of it. I must have looked manic, though. I attempted my best to keep the cool. Yeah, yep. Caught about seven or eight rats. Ah, pretty beat. Ready to go home. Well, you've got to get your lights and equipment all packed up. Rogers pointed toward the crawl space illuminated by jaundiced light. Thanked Rogers and waved him off to have a good night. Frayed nerves, an empty stomach, a throbbing migraine. It was time to get the hell home and unwind. Eat dinner and erase the day with some rest. Hello, I'm Catherine Cavendish, and this is an extract from my latest story from Flame Tree Press called Dark Observation. I hope you enjoy it. Are you sitting comfortably? And I shall begin. Bi opened her eyes. Something had woken her. She peered through the gloom. In the blackout, with no light seeping in from outside and none within, she could make out nothing. She reached out next to her to the bedside table, but her fingers met nothing. Until they knocked against some smooth and unfamiliar wood. With a rush of surprise, she realised she wasn't in bed. She was sitting on what seemed to be a ledge of some kind. I'm dreaming. I'll wake up soon. But something didn't feel right about that either. With her other hand, she felt next to her, and her fingers closed on the unmistakable shape of a simple candlestick, but it was more the size of one she would expect to find in a church. As her fingers travelled up its stem, she touched a large wax candle. Where there was a candle these days, a box of matches was usually not far away. By shifted position and her legs swung out. She was sitting on some kind of ledge. Taking care not to knock anything off, she heaved the candlestick from her right hand to her left and felt around for the matches. In a second they were in her grasp, an unusually large box of them. She placed the candle holder carefully down beside her and opened the heavy matchbox, taking care not to spill the contents on the floor. Who knew how high up she was? And she certainly wasn't about to find out by jumping off. She struck a giant-sized match and blinked at the flash of light. Her hands trembling, she lit the candle and peered out into the gloom. In front of her loomed a giant table and an equally massive chair. Against the wall, an impossibly enormous gas cooker stood four square on its cast iron legs. As she moved the candle around, she saw the floor a few feet beneath her. Into her mind flashed a picture from her childhood, John Tenniel's famous illustrations for Alice in Wonderland. When Alice took a drink, and shrank. Vi shook her head. This isn't real. It isn't happening. A loud thump set her ears ringing. It was followed by a series of raps and she recognised the sound of heels on linoleum that magnified ten, twenty times. More probably. She licked her fingers and snuffed out the flame, stifling a cry from the burn. The sound of the kitchen door opening was almost deafening, as were the voices that spoke. They seemed to be lower and slower than normal, like a record being played at the wrong speed. An unfamiliar male voice spoke. Someone has used a candle in here recently. I can smell it. Is the blackout in place? A familiar female voice answered. Yes. Mrs Harris doesn't really trust electricity. She uses candles frequently. I will turn on the lights. Vi was nearly blinded by the brightness. Her eyes watered and she shaded them until she could become accustomed. Once everything came into focus, she recognised Mrs Harris's kitchen, but from the perspective of a mouse, a small mouse trapped on a shelf. The now familiar brown painted shelf unit she saw every day, but never from this angle. She craned to see who the two people were who had come in. As she suspected, one was Sandrine. The other was a man of around the same age, maybe a little older. With his pencil moustache and slicked back hair, 
who resembled Clark Gable in profile. He stood directly in front of her. I prayed he wouldn't turn around. She could smell the brilliantine or brill cream in his hair and the strong smell of aftershave, which nearly choked her so that she had to cram her hand over her mouth. You are certain no one will disturb us? The man asked. They're all in bed. It is safer we talk down here. I share this house with two interfering silly young girls and an old woman who likes nothing more than to gossip about her neighbours. The man gave a long, lazy laugh. When he spoke again, Vi couldn't understand what he was saying. He spoke in a language that sounded European, probably Spanish or Italian, definitely not French or German. She caught the occasional familiar name. Churchill, Hitler, Mussolini. Surely they shouldn't be discussing them in such a clandestine fashion, and Mrs Harris had strict rules. This man wasn't even supposed to be here. Once or twice, Sandrine addressed him by name, Alex. She might not understand a word they were saying, but she was still vulnerable. What if they discovered her? They could crush her as easily as a fly. Vi looked anxiously around for something to hide behind and spotted a tin of cocoa. Silently, she edged her way along the shelf, noting she was dressed as she had been before she woke up there, in her nightgown with a pair of her brother's old socks on to keep the chill out. At least she wouldn't freeze to death until she found a way of returning to normal. A sudden fear struck her. She had shrunk to this size without warning. She could return to her normal size the same way. A momentary lapse in concentration saw her hand catch the edge of a piece of paper and the stub of a pencil. The paper floated, but the pencil made a sharp rat tat as it landed on the floor and rolled. I stood and made a dash for the cocoa tin, squeezing behind it a split second before the man spun on his heel and faced directly where she had been mere seconds earlier. What was that? Sandrine asked, looking around her. The man bent down and picked up the pencil. Just this. They put it on the scrubbed wooden draining board. I thought she was safe. Only for a second. Ah! We have a little visitor, he said. In a second, Vi was staring into two sets of enormous eyes, both with dark brown, almost black irises, Sandrine and her companion. Their gaze captivated her. She seemed to sink deeper and deeper into those eyes. Within them, something stirred. A winged creature, like a dragon, unfurled its wings and stretched them wide. It kept its head bowed. Eligos.